try that again. And you call me from the grave by name. And you call me out of all my shame. And I see the old is past. Let's give the Lord a hand. When I was a sinner, I was a slave to sin. I couldn't overcome it in my own strength. I was just bound by it. It was my master. And then when Jesus came into my life, he just destroyed the power of sin in my life. Destroyed it. And he gives me the power and the authority to live for him in Jesus' name.
we just bring you praise and glory and honor this morning everything you deserve God you are holy and worthy we bring an offering of praise to you this morning and we just thank you for the blood of Jesus in your name we pray amen you can be seated please this time I'd like to dismiss the kids third grade and down if you could go with Miss Robin in the back, am I right? My contacts are getting foggy. Let's give the kids a hand as they go.
If you would just join me in prayer for the offering. Heavenly Father, we just bring our tithes and our offerings this morning to you, God, as an act of worship. It's just an extension of just our gratitude to you and who you are, God. We worship you with our finances and, and the gifts that you've given us, God. We pray that you bless each gift this morning, every giver, God. We pray that you multiply it and ultimately that it would build your kingdom upon the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. <laughs> good to see all of you here today. And it's good to be seen today. I wasn't sure I was going to make it today. I've been really, really sick uh, this past week. And so my voice is uh, not really dependable this morning. But it's a chance to trust God for that also. Because today we're thinking about trust and what it means to really trust God totally for every uh, moment of our lives, for every direction that he might take us. But before we get into that topic, I want to call your attention to a verse that you read this week from Ephesians as you've been going through our reading together, Ephesians chapter 4. And in that chapter, Paul is talking about people who, who do not know Christ as their Savior. And he's saying that they... Their minds are blinded. They are darkened to truth. And he says that as believers, we should not be like that. There should be a, a contrast in the way that we approach Scripture, the way that we approach life. So in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, we read, They are darkened in their understanding, being alienated from the life of God, because ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. Verse 19, because they are callous, they have given themselves over to indecency for the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. These are people who do not know Jesus Christ. They are blinded. It says their hearts are hardened. That word hardened is used only three times in the New Testament. It's the Greek word porosis. And it was a kind of marble. But the word was used later to mean calloused or insensible or numb or having dulled perception. So their hearts are calloused. They are numb. They are not sensitive to the things of God. Sin makes people hard-hearted, causes them to be spiritually blind and past feeling. They are literally unable to respond to the things of God. They do not have that potential. It takes the conviction of the Holy Spirit to convince them that they are sinners. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit in order to remove the blindness so that they can hear the word of God and realize that they are convicted declared guilty because of sin. Have you ever tried to witness to a person like that who is just spiritually blind? They, they don't understand scriptural truth at all. And if you try to give them a lesson on doctrine, it's over their heads. I mean, they cannot, actually they cannot understand spiritual truth. So in our witnessing, it's important to know that our best approach is not to argue theology and try to argue people into heaven. Our responsibility is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ from Scripture. And the Holy Spirit takes the words of Scripture and bores into the hearts and minds of lost people and allows them, enables them supernaturally to begin to understand their state, to understand that they need a Savior, to comprehend the truths of God's Word. But they don't seem to know that, do they? And uh, even if they admit they're sinners... It's like they are numb or ignorant of the degree of deadness in their lives. The Bible says that a lost person, according to Ephesians 2.1, is dead in trespasses and sins. Dead. It's impossible for a dead person to respond. But that's how unbelievers are. Dead. It requires this special supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to rouse the human consciousness to a point of understanding the gospel and the claims of Christ. Ask the Holy Spirit then, when you go out to witness, ask the Holy Spirit to go before you to prepare hearts, to touch hearts, to open their minds, their understanding and ears to truth. Because without his work, a sinner is simply unable to to understand scriptural truth. 
Aren't you glad, if you know Jesus, that you have the Holy Spirit within you who enables you to understand the truths of God's word, who allows your heart to respond? Because Paul there in Ephesians 2 goes on to say to the Christians, and that's what you were. (laughs) That's what you were. We were all dead in sin, unable to respond to the truth of God's word. But the Holy Spirit intervened. He opened our eyes. He gave us the ability to respond, to understand. Thank God for the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. But be encouraged in your witness and know that your job is to present the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Keep pointing them to Christ using the words of Scripture which the Holy Spirit then will enliven and he will quicken their hearts with those eternal words of truth. But this morning we want to go to Genesis chapter 22, please. Genesis chapter 22, we're going to talk about inexorable trust. The word inexorable means unrelenting or unstoppable, unstoppable, relentless. Trust, what is trust? Trust is faith. That's what trust is. It means the same thing. We trust Christ. We trust his word. That means we, we have faith in Christ. We have faith in his word. It takes a lot to trust God, doesn't it? Particularly when we don't know what God's doing, <laughs> which is most of the time, all right? To trust him. You know, when the, when the way is dark, when we're a little confused as to what's going on in our lives and what the future of the church is and what's happening in our families and with our health and all these issues that come into our lives, sometimes it's really difficult. We're, we're blind. I mean, we cannot see the bigger picture that God sees. And it, so it's hard for us to really trust him relentlessly trust God in all circumstances. This morning I, I want to introduce to you Sammy and Chloe. There's a picture of them that's coming up on the screen. Uh, Sammy is a, an Ohio teenager and she, she loves to run. But when a rare eye disease uh, stole her vision, those tree-studded trails of cross-country running became too dangerous to tackle. She has what is called Stargardt's disease. It's a hereditary form of macular degeneration uh, that causes irreversible blindness. So in 2011, it seemed running would just be another sacrifice for the 16-year-old who will never be able to drive or have a normal life. But she found her way back into running and cross-country races with that one-and-a-half-year-old golden retriever called Chloe. And so uh, they, they run, they did run in cross-country races. She said, I've never bonded more with even a person than I have bonded with Chloe. Chloe knows she has to watch out for me. I can't imagine being without her now. Now they had to start 20 seconds after other runners. And while she could pass them and did, she was not allowed to impede them at all. She said, we had to make Chloe her own little jersey because she's a runner too. But Chloe, the dog, knew that she was part of the Lexington team. She would rise up on her hind legs and bark during the pre-race cheers. But when she was guiding Stoner through a bumpy trail or a busy street, it was all business. She was committed. She knew that the race could only be run successfully if she, Chloe, kept Sammy on the right path, kept her away from trees and brush and ditches, kept her within the chalk lines. So the dog really was the eyes for the runner. That's trust. Can you imagine taking off on a cross-country race blind? I mean, the total trust is in the dog. That dog meant everything to her, running the race and finishing the race. She said, the dog has always had the attitude that my life is in her hands. And Sammy said her attitude was that everything is going to work out. And that was the testimony of Ann Petrie, who was her junior varsity coach and her teacher during her diagnosis. She said she just takes it one step at a time, one problem at a time. She totally trusts in her companion, Chloe. I think that's a a picture and illustration of how we need to walk with the Lord because we really don't know all the 
hurdles. We don't know all the bypaths, the muddy places that we have to avoid. We don't know always where other people are around us as far as their attitudes and their reception of us is. We have to trust God with every detail. Trust him. So in Genesis chapter 22, we have an account of someone who trusted God. Abraham. He stands out in scripture as an impressive and important figure. We're given a lot of information about his life. He's highlighted in the Bible as a man of great faith. He was from the large, important city of Ur, you are, and thus he was a Gentile, although he became the first Hebrew. Now, Abraham did not give us any words of prophecy. He didn't write a book of the Bible. He didn't produce any songs that we know of. He didn't give us any laws like Moses recorded for us, and yet he alone is spoken of as the friend of God. The only character in the Bible called the friend of God until Jesus said, you are my friends if you obey me. But in the Old Testament, this is the guy that stands out as the friend of God. Isaiah 41 verse 8. James 2.23 says he was called the friend of God. In 2 Chronicles 20 verse 7, Jehoshaphat prays, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people, people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Little is known of him until he reached the age of 70. He died at the age of 175. I don't recommend living that long. (laughs) But he received a, a word from God, a revelation from God, some direction from God. We don't know exactly how or when, but we do know that he acted upon this word, this direction from God, and gave up a life of status quo to go on a journey with God to places he did not anticipate. You know, there are people of God even today who have that experience. They don't know where God's going to take them. They're just willing to go. God, you tell me, I'll follow. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. We see missionaries with that experience. I grew up in that kind of a home. My parents. uh, My parents trusted God every day, every step of their path as missionaries to two different, well, actually three different fields, started three different Bible institutes, also was a church planter, but they never knew where God was going to take them. And from the age of 30 on, Dad was never gainfully employed. Some of you may feel like that, but it's not intentional. But anyway, they deliberately gave up a business. He was a newspaper man, owned a newspaper business in western Nebraska. They gave that up and decided they were going to trust God wherever God led them. And he led them all over the place. They were never for sure, never sure where the next step might be, where God was going to take them. So I had a firsthand account of this. I saw this in my parents' life. And God loves people who are willing to trust him, totally trust him for whatever he calls them to do, wherever he might lead them. Abraham, Abraham, the man of faith. He delayed, it was many years before the promises given to him by God actually began to materialize, namely the promise of a great country, the promised land, Canaan, the promise of a great nation, Israel, the Jewish people, and a great blessing, the Messiah, all of that was centuries. In fact, we're still waiting uh, for many of the promises to the Jews to be fulfilled. But Abraham believed God for all of it. God had his covenant with Abraham. He believed God. He was a friend of God. Romans 4.11 says that he is called the father of all them that believe. So let's read the account here in Genesis 22. And want to begin at the beginning of the chapter, and I'll read through verse 14. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. I'm not going to tell you now. We'll get there. I'll let you know when we're there. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. 
When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Father, as we look at the account of Abraham in this situation, I pray that we would be encouraged, we would be motivated, we would be excited that you are a God who keeps your word. We can totally depend upon you in spite of what you may ask of us, require of us, in spite of the testings that we may go through. You are a faithful God and it pleases you when we trust you. In fact, you cannot be pleased unless we do trust you. So would you motivate us to trust you completely with an inexorable trust because you are God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, Abraham was like all other men. He had his failures. His conduct with Hagar was not good as he sent her away. His leaving Canaan for Egypt when famine arrived, that was certainly not an act of faith. God could have provided for him. The less than truthful explanation of his relationship to Sarah on two occasions was not an act of faith. In fact, it was a pretty selfish act on his part. But the account before us is both an act of trust and a trial, a test of his faith. When Abraham demonstrated his willingness to sacrifice his son of promise, don't miss that, This was not his only son, but it was his only unique son, which is what the word begotten means, the only begotten, his unique son. And when Abraham demonstrated he was willing to even sacrifice Isaac, he received the affirmation from God. God is pleased with him. God says, you are my friend, Abraham. There are many types of Jesus in Genesis, including Isaac, but Abraham is the only type of God the Father. God the Father. Abraham is so loved as to give up his only son. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, we read, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Does that sound like a familiar phrase? That's the King James Version, his only begotten son. Reminds us, of course, of God the Father in John 3.16, who gave his only begotten son that we might live through him. He so loved that he gave. And Abraham did not withhold this unique son of promise through which all the promises of an inheritance were going to come, and yet Abraham did not hesitate to give that up for God when God asked him to do that. 
Romans 8.32, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And that word spare in the Greek is the same word that is used in the Septuagint, which is the early Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Genesis 22, verse 12. You have not withheld or spared your son. So Abraham, in not sparing his son, is a beautiful picture of God the Father who did not spare his only begotten son for us. Trust, then, holds back nothing. Trust holds back nothing. Trust is not, well, God, I know you will provide for me, but just in case, I have this backup plan, plan B. You know, I've got this all taken care of, God, so, you know, if it doesn't work out like you say it's going to work out, or like I think you're saying it's going to work out, I've got a backup plan. No, trust holds back nothing. God, you have it all. All of me, all that I have, all my time, all my energy, it is all yours, God. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And now in our text, take your son, your only son, whom you love. And he was to go to Mount Moriah. It's where it wound up being. He didn't know when he started off. That's where they were going. But Moriah is the place where Solomon built the temple of the Lord. So that's kind of the connection there, Mount Moriah. Notice that trust obeys immediately. Obeys immediately. In verse 3 of our text, he got an early start on the three-day trip. Early the next morning, he rose up. That's about a 50-mile trip from Beersheba to Mount Moriah. But his obedience was immediate and it was unquestioning. God, this is what you're telling me to do? He got up early the next morning and off he went. Total and obedient, total obedience. Unquestioning obedience. Do you ever wonder if Sarah was aware of this little expedition? Yeah, it doesn't say. But she had to be wondering, uh, where are you going where are you and Isaac taking off to? Well, I don't know what he said. Maybe I, I don't want to talk about it right now. Or uh, where? I don't know. Doesn't say. But Sarah must have had to trust Abraham, like Abraham was trusting God. And so they went on their journey. They left immediately. And then I see that trust submits. Trust submits. Notice Isaac's faith. In verses 6 to 9, we read that Isaac carries the wood. He accepts his father's explanation. He allows himself to be bound on the altar. Do you have that kind of submission to your heavenly father? Wow. I mean, Isaac, his life was at stake, right? I mean, he's carrying the wood. He's bound on the altar. Dad's got the knife ready to plunge it into his chest. Trust submits. But trust also depends on God's provision. God will come through. Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb. Son, God's got this under control. I know what it looks like. (laughs) I know what it feels like in my heart. And maybe you're feeling what it might feel like in your heart as the knife goes in. But God has a plan. God is going to provide. God is our provision. We will trust God together, son. You have more to lose than I do. But we will enter into this together trusting that God will provide. Verse 8, his confidence was that God would provide. He had no idea how God would provide. Back in verse 5. Abraham said, we will worship and then we will come back. What was he thinking? God was telling him to go sacrifice his son and yet he says, we will come back. I wonder what was going through his mind. Well, scripture does not leave us to wonder. It answers the question in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. We read, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, all wrapped up in this son, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. 
Now listen to this from Hebrews. This is the word of God. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. Wow. Such a thing had never happened in Abraham's time. God had never brought someone back to life. It was unimaginable that someone would die and come back to life. But such was Abraham's trust in God that that's what he was thinking. Even if I do sacrifice my son, we will go back because God can raise him from the dead. And in a sense, of course, God did raise him, as it were, from the dead. Because in Abraham's mind, he was, he was a dead son. Genesis 22, verse 12, it talks about I know that you fear God. To fear God is to reverence him, to respect him, to trust him totally, to obey him without question. We sometimes think of fearing the God, uh, fearing God as we, we're scared of him. You know, like we're afraid of his judgment. We're afraid of what he might do to us or through us. But to fear him is not only to be aware that he is holy and righteous and the judge, but it's also to respect that he will fulfill his word. He will provide for us at every step of the way when we're walking in obedience, walking in obedience, submitting to his direction. And so in verse 14, Abraham named the place, the Lord will provide. God will provide. What are you needing today? In your walk of obedience to God, what is it that you need? Are you willing to say, God will provide. I don't know how. I don't know where it's going to come from. The path looks pretty, pretty thorny and twisted out there. But I'm confident God will provide. We can trust God. God has led us this far. He's going to continue to lead us. He will provide. In verse 13, an animal was provided as a substitute for Isaac in the offering. Of course, later, all of Israel would be offering animals to the Lord. Worship included accepting God's sacrificial substitute. Accepting that God was pleased with a substitute that traces all the way through the Old Testament. Every time they sacrificed an animal and put the blood of that animal on the altar, believing that that would cover their sin, that in God's eyes they were seen as clean because their sin was covered. They had to trust God that God meant it when he said, I will accept a sacrifice of an animal in your place. And of course, we come to the New Testament where the perfect Lamb of God, this is what we celebrate this morning, the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. The question is, do you trust God that Jesus' sacrifice was enough? He took our place. That means when Satan puts it in our noggin, you're a sinner. God can never use you. You're not worthy to go to church. You can't really serve the Lord. Look what you did in the past or in the present. Trust the provision that God has made. Jesus paid it all. God is satisfied with the sacrifice of his son. He didn't spare his son so that we could be declared righteous. No longer are we held guilty for our sin. When we have received Christ as our Savior, it's done. It's paid for. Never be judged for that. Trust him. When you don't trust God, you hurt him. You offend Jesus when you don't trust him. You say, well, you know, I have the gift of worry. That is, not, that is not a spiritual gift. You know, that, that is not something that pleases God. We are to trust him, trust him fully, believe that he will do what he says he's going to do. So God substitute his only son for us. The perfect sacrifice was made. Jesus, the perfect lamb of God. But the main point this morning is not substitutionary atonement. It's the obedient servant responding to God's direction at great cost and then receiving God's affirmation. I call you my friend. I call you my friend. Trust is validated by God. 
Abraham's faith was an active faith. He acted upon his trust. And it resulted in his justification. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Righteousness. And in verses 16 to 18 of our chapter, God reaffirms his covenant, all those promises to Abraham. Abraham, you've you've passed the test. And just to let you know, I was not going to go back on my word anyway. (laughs) All those promises to you about a land and a people and a Messiah coming through your line, I've not reneged on that. It's all still going to come true, Abraham. Trust is necessary to please God. You cannot please God without trusting him. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, what is faith? Faith is trust. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You don't please God when you don't trust him. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You believe that God loves you, you believe the price for sin has been paid, you believe that God rewards those who seek him diligently. That's trust, trusting God. Tim Hansel wrote in his article, Holy Sweat, (laughs) interesting title, but it's, it's about trusting God. Maybe you've heard this before, but it's worth hearing again. He writes, at first I saw God as my observer, my judge, keeping track of the things I did wrong so as to know whether I merited heaven or hell when I die. He was out there sort of like a president. But later on when I met Christ, it seemed as though life were rather like a bike ride, but it was a tandem bike. And I noticed that Christ was in the back helping me pedal. I don't know just when it was that he suggested we change places, but life has never been the same since. When I had control, I knew the way. It was rather boring, but predictable. It was the shortest distance between two points. But when he took the lead, he knew delightful long cuts. (laughs) Up mountains, through rocky places, at breakneck speeds, It was all I could do to hang on. And even though it looked like madness, he'd say, pedal. I worried and was anxious and asked, where are you taking me? He laughed and didn't answer, and I started to learn to trust. I forgot my boring life and entered into the adventure. And when I'd say, I'm scared, he'd lean back and touch my hand. He took me to people with gifts that I needed, gifts of healing, acceptance, and joy. They gave me gifts to take on my journey, my Lord's and my journey. And we were off again. He said, give the gifts away. (laughs) They're extra baggage, too much weight. So I did to the people we met. And I found that in giving, I received, and still our burden was light. I did not trust him at first in control of my life, I thought he'd wreck it. But he knows bike secrets. He knows how to make it bend to take sharp corners. He knows how to jump over high rocks. He knows how to fly to shorten scary passages. And I'm learning to shut up and pedal (laughs) in the strangest places. And I'm beginning to enjoy the view and the cool breeze on my face with my delightful, constant companion, Jesus Christ. And when, when I'm sure I just can't do any more, he just smiles and says, pedal. <laughs> trusting God. Trusting him to be in control. Trusting him to set the direction. Trusting him to know what's best. Trusting him to take us through those delightful long cuts. To take us on journeys we never thought possible. And yet he is there to guide us, to protect us, to give us all the provision we need on the ride. Trusting him. Father, I thank you for the fact that Jesus is trustworthy. And I pray this morning that we may may know the joy of inexorable trust. May we relinquish all rights to steer the bike. 
May we relinquish all of our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations, and turn them over to you. Whatever it takes, sacrifice to you, showing others that we trust you inexorably. Father, I thank you that you are trustworthy. I thank you for your only begotten son that you sacrificed in your mind before the world was even created and your son agreed to that plan before the world was ever created and as the spotless, sinless lamb of God, he went on the altar. He gave his life for us. This morning as we partake of communion, I pray that we would bear in mind that he has proven himself trustworthy in his sacrifice for us. And may that motivate us to trust him with a sacrifice of our lives for him. Thank you for the Lamb of God, Jesus, our Savior, your Son, in whose name we pray, amen. So this morning, I want to give you just an opportunity to prepare for communion. Scripture is very clear that as we come together, this is called the fellowship of the Lord's table. So first of all, it's the ownership is there. It's the Lord's table. Secondly, we are called to fellowship. We do this as a body together. And Paul, in instructing the Corinthian believers, told them in chapter 11, that it's important for them and for us to examine ourselves before we partake of this. That examination takes the form of asking God to reveal to us if there is any unconfessed sin in our lives that is interrupting our fellowship with him. It's grieving him because we're not trusting him. We're grabbing the controls again. So sin is you know, missing the mark of what God has for us. So we need to confess that sin. And confession means we are saying we're turning from it. It's not just saying I'm sorry. It involves repentance. God, you're showing me this is wrong in my life. I'm going to do what it takes to make it right. You've paid the price, but I need to take a step of faith. I need to follow you and accept the provisions you've made. Sometimes that's restoration that's required if we've done something wrong. Sometimes it's getting with our brother or sister and saying, you know, I've held something against you. There's been something between us in our relationship. Let's make this right. Let's enjoy our fellowship in the Lord. Fellowship is the sharing of resources and responsibilities. God has put us together in this church. He's given us responsibilities, but he's also given us resources. And we're resources to one another. So fellowship is that which we share not only with Jesus, but with one another. He says, if you walk in the light, you will have fellowship with one another and with me. He is the light. We follow him. So preparing yourself for communion means confessing sin that God calls to mind with the intent of abandoning that sin, repenting of that sin. So I ask you to do that in these few moments as you prepare. Uh, When we ask you to come to receive the elements, if you'll exit your aisle, exit your row on the aisle where a person is standing, go out that way and then come back the other end of the, of the row to get back to your seat. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this is not only a privilege to do this together, it's a command. Jesus said, do this, do this until I return. And so we are being obedient to the Lord like Abraham was. We're submitting to his direction when we humbly come before him with cleansed hearts and partake of this together. The instructions are in your bulletin as far as how we do this, but you'll be coming up and you will uh, take one of the wafers or gluten-free items in the center and dip it in a cup and then uh, take part of that as you come forward. Father, I thank you for the shed blood and the broken body of Christ, our Passover lamb. May we not do this carelessly. 
but in recognition of what it cost you, what it cost him, in recognition of our own unworthiness, but of our acceptance because of his sacrifice for us. So may we do this as an act of worship and obedience and submission for the glory of Jesus. Amen.